1597, a surgeon named Gasparo Tagliacozzi wrote, We restore, repair, and redo those parts of the body that nature gave, but misfortune has taken, not enough to delight the eye, but enough to lift the spirit and help the mind of the afflicted. Tagliacozzi was convicted of interfering with God's creation. Four centuries later, another doctor in cosmetic and reconstructive surgery followed Tagliacozzi's words. Sometimes people overlook is that as we're aging and we look in the mirror, you know, the little person that we continually have a dialogue with, if they look in the mirror and they see aging, many times depending on their emotional maturity, which is always little because it's the little person, they are fearful that we're going to be closer to death. And many people don't look at it that way. But it's blatantly obvious that sometimes if you look younger or you look healthier, the person can rest and relax. Because we made a contract. The contract you make when you're younger, as you're growing up, as you separate from the little person and become the guardian the real guardian of, of the little person, that you were going to take care of me. We are in the Sanctuary Medical Aesthetic Center, Smack Boca, located in Boca Raton, Florida. In this facility, cosmetic surgeries, laser and varicose vein treatments, weight loss and other services are offered making people feel good about their physical appearances. Among the specialists here, we find Dr. Kurt Joseph Wagner. After 30 years in Beverly Hills, he continues to bring youth and options to his patients. You know, his brain is unbelievable. It's just a wealth of knowledge, and uh, really it's impressive to be able to work with him. I've learned quite a few things from him, and I took my training, and he kind of refined a lot of my training with things that were, you know, classic. Just he's done so many of these procedures. He basically taught me rhinoplasty from scratch. So we do a pretty good nose now because of, because of Kurt. Lots of tricks and tips and facelifts, surgery that he, that he taught me. So I'm definitely a better surgeon than you because of Kurt. I think that, you know, and what you're speaking to related to repairing or modifying or improving um, someone's naturally, uh, natural anatomy, um, I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a quick, it's a quick repair and it, it's, a, a, it, it's, a, it's an, a dramatic shift in somebody's outside. Um, and there's a connection between that and what's going on between their emotional insides. In his own field, uh, it, totally ignoring his abilities, because he has far more talented than many people in his field, is that um, when a patient walks in, he doesn't try to sell them anything. And what he asks them right away is, um, tell me, you know, you know if, if you could make, if you had a list of all the things you want to change, what is it you want? What is it you'd like to do? And then, unlike other doctors, when you've given this list, which in most cases is pretty unreliable, pretty, um, pretty extensive, because everybody dreams of more than is possible, he'll say, "I'm going to tell you right now, don't waste your money. Okay, um, I'll do this and this, but those other three things, forget it. Okay, uh, it's not going to change anything for you." 
and in that way, um, he probably loses a lot of business, but he develops a trust because we know whatever it is he tells you he can tackle, it's genuine. My name is Kurt Wagner. By trade, I'm a plastic surgeon. In the mid-1960s, when being young and handsome in the United States was important to hold a job, Wagner wrote the book, A Plastic Surgeon Answers Your Questions, which brought to ordinary people the benefits of plastic surgery. I, I may have told about a story of a little 16-year-old girl that was living in New Jersey, very unpopular, oh. because she had a nose like a horse. And she was true, smart, beautiful, lovely otherwise, but every day was painful for her to go to school. And so her father found out about my husband from another friend, from someone at UCLA. This one we were in California. But this one day I was helping out, and my job was the woman, the mother of this daughter had said, now, when we're finished with the surgery, because usually when you're done with the surgery, that is the way the nose will look. Mm. And then after a short while, the swelling comes in, and then, of course, it's totally different. So Kurt said, honey, your job is going to be to take the mom back, show, right after the surgery, you show the mother her daughter's nose, and then take her out, and we'll bandage her up, and we'll do everything. Okay. So when it came time, I took the mom in, and my gosh, I can still remember to this day, and this is probably 40 years ago, she stood there with tears rolling down, and she said, I always dreamed I'd have a daughter who would look like that. And that was what happened. And then, here's the best P.S. postscript to the entire story. The next year, Kurt got a letter. Dear Dr. Kurt, thank you so much. I am the prom queen. I am the cheerleader. I am the this. I am now ready to go to college. You have changed my life. So I think there's, I think there's a, there's a, it's a complex interrelated phenomenon that, that somebody goes to a gifted plastic surgeon, they have this physical repair, this anatomical repair, which has, in some cases, maybe even many cases, um, it, it has profound impacts on how people conduct themselves in their lives, professionally, personally, uh, into their interpersonal relationships. So, so there certainly is a connection between somebody's physical changes externally and their emotional changes internally. How long-lasting it is and, and how sophisticated that person's pathologies are, of course, vary, but uh, there, there certainly is a connection. He popularized cosmetic surgery in the doctor's clinic to reduce costs without affecting the quality of the procedure. He used to have two, in his first office, he used to have two ORs. And he would have them both going, like, one would be getting set up, the other one would be, you know, it was amazing. And then he, in between both of those, he'd go see the people in the waiting room was always full. I mean, he probably, maybe eight, ten surgeries in a day. Um, when we were in the surgery center, he maybe did five or six a day. He was very demanding, but, yeah. you know, you kind of learned his routine. You had to have everybody ready, because he would jump from surgery to, the, to taking out stitches and checking up on the post-ops, and then he'd run back into surgery. And so, you know, I would have to go back, okay, we're ready. And he'd go, okay, take a break, come see him, and go back out. So it was... Hollywood's stars-to-be soon learned about Dr. Wagner's work in breast design. One day, a future patient lacked the funds to pay for a procedure. She was a press agent, and Kurt Wagner saw an opportunity to expand his business. Talk shows on TV. The world's first extreme makeover was born. The show was seen by millions in New York, Chicago, and Europe. Next came an article in Look Magazine, 
and two appearances on the Merv Griffin Show, accompanied by his wife, Kathy. Okay. <laughs> this way? Quite a surprise. It is for us, <laughs> <laughs> What's so wonderful is that when you have this surgery done, it doesn't hurt. You get an intravenous fouling shot right into your arm. He kisses you and what you do fall asleep. Do you, <laughs> you wake up and it's great. Huh. You, get, you, put these, you put these funny little bandages on with a Mickey Mouse or a Donald Duck or some kind of a face on there. I love it. She talks just like Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> you do. You, t you have a nice... Thank you. This is your sign, in other words. Yeah. Wagner suffered the consequences of this new fame. He was accused of self-aggrandizement, and he eventually quit the Los Angeles County Medical Association. His controversial media appearances disrupted his professional life, but they changed the public's perception of cosmetic surgery forever. To know the essence of this man, the first surgeon to talk on late night TV about the advantages of cosmetic procedures. Let's make a journey to Vienna in 1934. Kurt Joseph Wagner made his appearance in the world in the same year that Adolf Hitler became Chancellor of Germany. The world was suffering under a global economic crisis. On March 14, 1938, the Fuhrer declared the annexation of Austria to Germany before 250,000 local supporters during his triumphal entry into Vienna. He came from a wealthy Viennese family who were descended from Wenzel Anton Kaunitz Rietberg, the Chancellor of State under Maria Theresa of Austria. Oskar Kaunitz, Kurt's grandfather, was an obstetrician and third generation of doctors. Oskar's daughter, Sonia, agreed to marry Bernard Warhaftig, a future psychiatrist, their family name, Varhoftig, was changed to Wagner, Wagner, more Teutonic and suitable for those times. So my father left just in the nick of time because they went looking for him. Now, because of the fact that his cousin was a union organizer and there was an election coming up and there was a Senator Wagner, right? Just serendipity because there was a Senator Wagner, he said, hey, you have some relatives here because Wagner's origins were Germanic. Mm -hmm. And, you know, uh, he was an LRB, he was a socialist, I guess, himself, but whatever he was, he sent this cablegram, and my mother and I got a visa when we couldn't get one. That doesn't mean that people didn't get, we weren't the last boat, but that was our, our escape, okay? At only 14 months, Curdy could speak in complete sentences. At age two, he could read and write, and when he was three, his grandfather gave him a small doctor's coat embroidered with Dr. Curdy. A somber air swept over life in Vienna curfews, identity checks, supervision of financial activities, and open attacks on Jewish families. People rushed to leave the country. On November 11, 1938, with the sound of broken glass in the streets, Oskar Kaunitz and his wife accompanied their daughter and grandson to the station for a sad farewell on Kristallnacht. The old doctor left his grandson with a commitment that would accompany him for all his life. 
God has given little to few, much to some, but to you, my dear Curdie, you got it all. You must help every person you meet, if you say so, Dad. And you want to know something? That was one of the most expensive. Yeah, but it was just so impressive. It was, it was impressive so when close. I came to America. It was. I mean, I, and I was saying, you know how many of our ancestors came here and saw and saw this? I mean, so you, you want to film this? So this is actually would be interesting. So this is Kurt. This is where I was last week. Um, I, we had, I was on a medical cruise in the, in, the, in the Hudson just because of, it was part of this event I was on. But we all went by this, and you saw this when you were... I uh, saw this when I was four years, seven months, and 22 days. Yeah. Give me your tired, your poor, your huddled masses, yearning to breathe free. The wretched refuse of your teeming shore, send these, the homeless, tempest-tossed to me. I lift my lamp beside the golden door. In November 1938, the little boy and his parents were among the 95,000 Jews who emigrated to the United States that year. After a frustrating year for the Wagners, Kurt's father managed to get the medical license he needed to practice. The last days of 1939 pointed to the wonders in store for the future. With the theme, Building the World of Tomorrow, a group of businessmen planned the second general exhibition in New York with the intention that it would become the most important event since the First World War. While visiting the New York World's Fair of 1939 with Kurt, his mother, Sonia, saw a friend from Vienna. The meeting brought back memories of home, and after the friend went on his way, Sonia broke down in tears. As his mother sat and sobbed on a park bench, Kurt stood by, unable to comfort her. Kurt recalled in his memoir that a man-sized mouse appeared. Seeing the woman's sadness, the large-eared creature grasped her hands and started a merry dance with a song. Tears soon turned to into laughter, and from that time on, a magic talisman came into my life. Dr. Wagner continues to wear a Mickey Mouse watch today. In 1958, Kurt's life was running at high speed. After finishing as Phi Beta Kappa at NYU, the 24-year-old Wagner graduated from the College of Medicine of New York City. He completed his internship at Long Island Jewish Hospital in New Hyde Park, and he was now the fifth generation of physicians. After completing his stint as an intern in 1959, Dr. Wagner was on Route 66, headed to California. Kurt was married to Barbara Jean Wallace with a child and was starting a practice of surgery at Cedars of Lebanon. At that time, the institution had contracts from the Screen Actors Guild, so it was not uncommon to see movie stars, past and present, in the public hallway or as patients. I just had story after story after story. You know, I can remember what I had for breakfast, but he'll tell you where he was when he had breakfast. When he saw this movie star and all these movie stars, he operated on it. It was impressive, a lot, but a lot of them were dead, so we didn't care. He was teaching us a lot of steps, and we got that story about Ginger Rogers and Fred Astaire, that uh, he was able to dance with Ginger, so it was pretty impressive. We, we razzed him a lot, but you know that's a pretty damn impressive story. I think the people I grew up with all had special fathers, so they were either actors or, you know, they wealthy, nice uh, people that had a lot of... But everybody, you know, everybody loved my dad, and he was always very adventurous, and we always went and did things, and if they were ever with us, let's say, on a vacation, we just played and had fun, and, you know, it was, it was fun. Hi. Hi. So, so, um... You're on speakerphone, and we've just completed um, 
the something video that I naturally stumbled upon was your entertainment qualities and telling a joke. And I, I talked a little bit about the professor, the Viennese professor. Mm -hmm. Oh, you mean the ghost? The ghost. Professor Hans von Frucht from Austria, yeah, expert on extraterrestrial and other things, was giving his semi-annual discussion about the afterlife. He says, my dame and herren, ladies and gentlemen, senores and senoritas, I can't believe this. How many people here have slept with a ghost? One guy in the back raises his hand. He says, oh, please, make room. Come, come here, please, please, make room, make room. Tell us everything, every word, every syllable, every feeling that you had. Oh, I think I made a mistake. And I'm awfully sorry. I thought you said goats. After three years at Cedars of Lebanon, Dr. Wagner felt it was time to go after his dream. He moved to Oklahoma City, Hospital of San Antonio, to be a resident doctor. Then he moved to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio, where he became chief of plastic surgery. During a visit to a nearby Dow Corning factory, he made an interesting renovation in the design of one of Dow's products which became known as Wagner's Breast Implant. I never had nice breasts. And when I met my husband, I was wearing two falsies on each side in my bra. And I was so embarrassed. I was afraid to have him even hug me or touch me because you feel a little bong. And it just was so terrible. But he didn't mind. He went ahead. We married. And we were married in New York, the little church around the corner. His mother had an exceptional reception for us. Mm -hmm. That's another story. And then we came down here to Miami and had our honeymoon. Mm -hmm. Now, there was the Doral Hotel then. I am swimming. I have my little green with pink polka dot bikini on. And all of a sudden, falsies come floating out in my bathing suit. They are floating in the water to the right, and I'm hightailing it to the left. I was so embarrassed. My world fell apart. But the first thing I did was go up to our room. I called the office, scheduled myself for surgery. And then, as I'm getting ready to have the surgery, it's pretty saying, fine, you know, great. I can understand that you'd like to have that done so you don't have to wear your falsies all the time. It'll make your body feel better. You'll have a whole different feeling about life and everything. It did. It made my cheekbones look better. Mm -hmm. I lost weight because you didn't want to eat so much. It mm -hmm. was fabulous and fantastic. And these are just on me. And maybe you would think that I'm very vain, mm -hmm. but slight little adjustments that can be done will change your whole life. In 1966, Dr. Kurt received his certification as a plastic surgeon number 743. At 32 years old, with two daughters and three months after becoming a widow, the new doctor moved to Los Angeles, California. There he met a school teacher, Kathy Kelly, who would soon become his wife. A year later, Wagner's new family moved to Mulholland Drive with a panoramic view of the San Fernando Valley. Beverly Hills received him with open arms. But the bottom line is that we provide a service. We an integral part of the world and we make the world better. And there's no... The couple is the subject of a TV interview, later broadcast by the BBC Service, a documentary that shows the life and work of a plastic surgeon. Years later, a reality show called Dr. 90210 appeared to remind us of that early documentary on 
Kurt Wagner. At the same time, a Los Angeles Times Magazine article profiled Dr. Wagner, where he talked about what it's like to be a plastic surgeon in Beverly Hills. He also spoke about life, freedom, and the quest for beauty and psychological health. Kurt and Kathy are now everywhere. They are seen on TV, in magazines, in France, Germany, England, even Australia. Funny, when you think of what my office was like, and in a way it's cozy here, yeah. you know, memories of getting married, being famous enough so that for our 25th anniversary, the city of Los Angeles gave us a happy prosperity anniversary wish. Not many people get that, mm -hmm. right? So, and then there's books that I wrote, books that I wish that I wrote, and of course my pal is here, isn't he? Mickey. He's not really Dr. Kurt, but I love him anyway. But here's my favorite. And they took it away. Oh. Because they... Here. This is one of my favorites. <laughs> Later, in need of a break from increasing pressures, he and his wife Kathy went to Costa Rica for a while. And then in 1998, the Wagners moved to Florida. The millennium found Kurt with a new vigor. Providence put him in touch with Jason Posner, a young surgeon who was starting a cosmetic center in Boca Raton. This is where we find him today, overseeing the nonprofit organization he founded in 1975, ASTAR the American Society of Aesthetics and Therapeutic Rejuvenation and Regeneration. The main objective of ASTAR is to support research and provide information to medical professionals and the general public about the psychological benefits of plastic surgery. I mean, there's so many things special about him. As a doctor, as I said before, he's an innovator. He was an innovator amongst innovators. He was incredibly skilled. Um, he, he would attempt procedures that, that, that I would venture to say probably most surgeons won't even attempt. Um, you know, so there's, there's various ways of going about it. Well, was, was he radical? You know, was he confident? You know, was it someplace in between? Was it both? That can be anybody. Anybody can be an innovative in some way. It might not be in a particular profession, it might be in another kind of innovation, but um, I, I think we can also learn how to tolerate differences in other people. Um, Kurt's story, I think, tells us that um, when we meet someone like Kurt, uh, we all can be supportive of him. So that. It's not a competition, it's um, here's some talent that is ready to take wing 
and um, let's not hold it back. I think that's one of the messages from the, the life of Kurt and why we love him so much. Well, with, with Kurt, there's really no doctor-patient relationship because everybody becomes his friend. Um, I first met Kurt as a doctor you know, with something serious that other doctors wouldn't, wouldn't uh, pay attention to. And um, instantly, instantly, he was my best friend. In fact, uh, uh, when I did have surgery, uh, Kurt's the only person I ever know who made house calls, would call me up daily, check on me. So actually, with, with Kurt, there's very little separation. He's probably the most attentive doctor I've ever known, and because he has an exceptional memory, he really doesn't, uh, um, he doesn't forget anything. And when, it, when he knows he's had a patient and it's been a day or two, he knows he'll automatically just check on them no matter what. She said, what's, it, what's it like to work with Kurt? Yeah. You know, it's, it's entertaining. You know, his brain is unbelievable. It's just a wealth of knowledge and uh, really it's impressive. Real In 1971, Kurt Wagner appeared on the Merv Griffin Show to promote a book. He was accused by the local medical association of self-aggrandizement. 1975, he appeared as one of the Super Doctors, a book by Roger Rappaport that profiled the most important doctors of the time. Wagner became famous for inserting implants that were adapted especially to the patient. He was incredibly skilled. He developed numerous, um, you know, breast implants, um, uh, he, cheek implants, chin implants. Um, he, he, he was just incredible. And he said, but meanwhile, while you're on my table, the operating table, I just would like to kind of pin back your ears just a wee bit because they were they did stick out a little when we look at early pictures of me. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, your daddy didn't have much of a chin. So I I have a Wagner chin Ivan made and no scar. I'll go right in through your mouth. No pain, no anything. And it will make such a big difference. He wrote Beauty by Design with another doctor, Gerald Imber, and he also created a charity similar to Astar's, which gave medical procedures to people who couldn't afford them, a program called A Little Help for Our Friends. I think he'll do anything for his friends. I mean, patients become his friends, but of course there are some that are a little more special. And I really think that I've, I value his friendship more than his abilities as a doctor. But there were times when he questioned what other doctors did and he'd automatically just remember to ask me about that and he'd confront the other doctors and I don't think anybody else would do that. Um, uh, he is an unusual friend in that he will interfere with other doctors' treatments if he thinks there's something not right. And uh, ironically, of all the times he's interfered, and it's been life and death situations, and he's helped me out of several times, um, he's never been wrong. And these were things that weren't in his field. So I value him really more than anything as a friend. Um, but as a doctor, I think I've been blessed because uh, he knows far more than the field of plastic surgery. And he, he never hesitates uh, to question other doctors. Dr. Wagner collected posters by the artist Toulouse-Lautrec. He donated his collection to the Los Angeles County Museum of Art. Later, in need of a break from increasing pressures, he and his wife Kathy went to Costa Rica for a while. And then in 1998, the Wagners moved to Florida. There are to see and going to the movies and the movies you know were dubbed in English or sometimes dubbed in Spanish didn't matter we had fun great chicken was there and I remember that I saw a squirrel an albino squirrel that was living outside of our little house the Millennium found Kurt with a new 
vigor. Providence put him in touch with Jason Posner, a young surgeon who was starting a cosmetic center in Boca Raton. And I was amazed that this guy, after so many years of practice, was able to hang with us all day in the operating room till late, get up to early the next morning. So one was energy level was unbelievable. Yeah. So we love Kurt. We're, it was such a pleasure to have him here in our office and hopefully have many more years of, uh, of Kurt Wagner uh, as a part of our team. Now in its ninth decade, Dr. Wagner rejoices with the legacy he will leave to Sophia his granddaughter, who regenerates the hope and joy for life. Dr. Wagner says that each day brings a new dawn and that the positive side often outweighs the negative. Holocaust survivor, life member of the American Society of Plastic Surgeons, designer, movie trailer maven, promotional innovator, and a visionary of cosmetic surgery as a tool for beauty. Dr. Wagner grew up with a mission and he has always perceived it. You must help every person you meet. Can you sing a song for me? You hold the future of this video in your hands. Please pass on the internet link or the DVD or the video file and give it to another person. Thank you very much. The man's job is to keep people looking younger by means of plastic surgery. Along with uh, notables in the public eye, uh, Dr. Wagner's practice caters to working people of all income brackets. It's always been thought in the past this was a very expensive process. Would you welcome the author of the forthcoming book, The Youth Came. Here's Dr. Kurt Wagner. I would say the rich dowager, the movie star or starlet, is a very small percentage of any plastic surgeon's practice. Plastic surgeons practice on the average person, by and large. The working uh, woman, the executive, the young teenagers, the elderly, the very young. And uh, because you mentioned the fire, of course, we take care of people who've been burned as well. Right. People who are born with congenital defects. Now, I mean, do you get uh, uh, truck drivers or construction workers? Yes, you do get truck drivers and construction workers. Really? Some who want hair transplants. Some who want nose jobs, some who want their ears pinned back, some who just want to look a little bit better and more respectable, some with tattoos that they want removed. Uh, seriously speaking, facelifts and eye lifts are temporary things, and anyone who says they're going to last forever is lying. They're temporary things, they uh, make you look more relaxed, more refreshed. Hopefully they don't change your facial expressions so that you look like you and not a mask. And they unfortunately hold time back just a little while and five, six, seven years later. Do you see anything here that needs to be done, doctor? Oh, sure. I see oh, something sure. in everyone. <laughs> what would you do? What would you suggest? Well, I really wouldn't discuss it because 
Why? I don't suggest anything. When a patient comes into my office, they ought to have a good idea of what they want. And then I'll either agree or disagree. I'll just give you, for instance, when I was in training, I met a woman who had a son with ears that stuck out, just like that. And at that time, you want the experience, and you, I said, my God, if a wind will come, your son will be lifted. And <laughs> your son ought to have his ears pinned back. She said, well, I never thought of it that way, but I think it's a good idea. The next morning, her husband came in. He was about seven feet tall, 280 pounds, and he had ears that stuck out like that. And he picked me up, and he said, I don't see anything wrong with my kid's ears. And he was right. There was nothing wrong with it. <laughs> so that was the last suggestion I made. <laughs>